Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bobemi. And I'm dead inside. And that's Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> he started wagging his tail. And welcome back to another episode of Aragon. Wow. Too much energy for you? Did you know if you replace the E with a D, it says dragon? I didn't. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. <laughs> I was trying to think, like, what happened last time. His dragon... There's a dragon. It grew up. And then he learned he wanted to learn about dragons. And then Brahm said, Here's some stuff about dragons. And then now what's his face? Roran is gonna move away to work at the mill. That's a big that's a big development. <laughs> Ror Roran is moving away. Because he wants to get a wifey. Specifically Katrina, which is Sloane's dad. Sloane, what did you just say? Dad. Dad? Dad. Daughter. Dot. Dad. <laughs> Sloane's dad. I don't like that. Um, <laughs> and I think the last we heard, Aragon finally fucking got his shit together and was going to be like, I'm going to go talk to him. And then yep. got butt hurt because Roran didn't take his rock or whatever. Stupid polished rock. Roran was like, I realistically don't need this. And then he thought, I'll Aragorn be... hates me anyway. Because, like, Roran's coming back. So yeah. he probably was just like, uh, I don't need to take this with me. Like, this is going to take up literally that much space. So and we I'll leave it here. Times. And I'll come back. <laughs> and Roran yep. was like, or Aragorn was like. <clears throat> Children. Good recap. <clears throat> Here we go. Chapter 9. Strangers in Carvajal. Breakfast was cold, but the tea was hot. Ice inside the windows had melted with the morning fire and soaked into the wood floor, staining it with dark puddles. Aragon looked at Garrow and Roran by the kitchen stove and reflected that this would be the last time he saw them together for many months. Many months, Aragon, not forever. <laughs> Roran sat in a chair, lacing his boots. His full pack rested on the floor next to him. Garrow stood between them with his hands stuck deep into his pockets. His shirt hung loosely. His skin looked drawn. Despite the young man's cajol... Cajoling? Cajoling. Cajoling? Cajoling. Caterwauling? <laughs> Ca cajoling? Dude, I don't know. He just looked up in a thesaurus, a word, and just threw it in there. His... Despite the young men's caterwauling, he refused to go with them. When pressed for a reason, he only said that it was for the best. Do you have everything? Gera asked Roran. Yes. He nodded and took a small pouch from his pocket. Coins clinked as he handed it to Roran. I've been saving this for you. It isn't much, but if you wish to buy some bauble or trinket, it will suffice. Thank you, but I won't be spending my money on trifles, said Roran. Do what you will. It is yours, said Gero. I have nothing else to give you except a father's blessing. Take it if you wish, but it is worth little. Roran's voice was was thick with emotion. I would be honored to receive it. Aww. Then do, and go in peace, said Garrow, and kissed him on the forehead. He turned and said in a louder, louder voice, Do not think I have forgotten you, Aragon. I have words for both of you. It's time I said them, as you are entering the world. Heed them, and they will serve you well. He bent his gaze sternly on them. First... Let no one rule your mind or body. Take special care that your thoughts remain unfettered. One may be a free man, and yet be bound tighter than a slave. Give men your ear, but not your heart. Show respect for those in power, but don't follow them blindly. Judge with logic and reason, but comment not. Consider none your superior, whatever their rank or station in life. Treat all fairly, or they will seek revenge. Be careful with your money. Hold fast to your beliefs, and others will listen. He continued at a slower pace. Of the affairs of love, my only advice is to be honest. That's your most powerful tool to unlock a heart or gain forgiveness. That is all I have to say. He seemed slightly self-conscious of his speech. He hoisted <laughs> Roran's pack. Now you must go. Dawn is approaching, and Dempton will be waiting. So he just gave some like serious life advice, and he's like, that's it. That's it. And he's like, I think, I hope, I hope that's good advice. 
I felt like that was good advice. It's fantastic advice, but they're like children. They'll probably just be like, okay, hey, whatever. Rowan's probably like, yes, yes, father. But Aragon's like, I have a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a dragon rider. Rowan shouldered his pack and hugged Garrow. I will return as soon as I can, he said. Good, replied Garrow. And now go and don't worry about us. They parted reluctantly. Aragon and Rowan went outside, then turned and waved. Garon raised a bony hand, his eyes grave, and watched as they trudged to the road. After a long moment, he shut the door. As the sound carried through the morning air, Roran halted. Aragon looked back and surveyed the land. His eyes lingered on the lone buildings. They looked pitifully small and fragile. A thin finger of smoke trailing up from the house was the only proof that the snowbound farm was inhabited. There is our whole world, Roran observed somberly. Aragon shivered impatiently and grumbled. A good one, too. Roran nodded, then straightened his shoulders and headed into his new future. The house disappeared from view as they descended the hill. It was still early when they reached Carval Hall, but they found the smithy doors already open. The air inside was pleasantly warm. Baldor slowly worked two large bellows attached to the side of a stone forge filled with sparkling co- coals. Just a comment on like what previously happened, like what previously like went on. There is our whole world, Roran observed somberly, and Aragorn was like a good one too. Kind of seems like. Roran is like kind of like the traveler like he wants yeah. to like move on he wants to go to a different city and do different things and Aragon seems kind of like no the farm is our life farm is life brother yeah I feel like I mean that speaks to like me on a personal level because I'm like leaving home when I was 18 and I was like wow there is my whole world and then me I'm just like let's fucking go Um, but like I don't think because it's when he says, like, there's our whole world, it doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. Like, But it sounds like there's our whole world and there's more that we can, ac- like, there's more. Like, that's how I infer it. Obviously, like, everyone infers books differently, I feel like. Because, like, he could also mean, too, like, like there's my whole world I'm just leaving behind. Like, he doesn't necessarily. Just it did because, say somberly, too. Yeah. And so he's like, w- like, I'm leaving it all behind to go make a life. And, um. And fucking Aragon just, like, doesn't even pick up on that, I feel like. He's just like, it's a good life, too. Ooh, it's our whole, ooh, <laughs> ooh. Like, yeah, okay, Aragon, like, we get it. He never said he wasn't coming back. Yeah. He's, like, literally coming back in a few months. Yeah, he literally said he'll come back. Before the forge stood a black anvil and an iron-bound barrel filled with brine. From a line of neck-high poles protruding from the walls hung rows of items, giant tongs, pliers, hammers in every shape and weight, chisels, angles, center punches, files, rasps, latches, bars of iron and steel waiting to be shaped, vices, shears, picks, and shovels. That's it? That's it? <laughs> Horst and Dempton stood next to a long table. Dempton approached, they literally could have cut that entire part down to, Horst and Dempted stood next to a long table in front of a wide vary of blacksmithing tools that you would expect to see at a blacksmithy. Yeah, like he could have like included. Okay, I get it. Um, like he could have included like a couple. He didn't have to include every single thing they sell. And <laughs> just like googled, what do they have at a blacksmithy? And was like, yes, mm. yes. Just I'll like put all copy that. Copy and pasted from a Wikipedia page. <laughs> Dempton approached with a smile beneath his flamboyant red must mustache roarin i'm glad you came there's going to be more work than i can handle with my new grindstones are you ready to go roarin hefted his pack yes do we leave soon i have a few things to take care of first but we'll be off within the hour aragon shifted his feet as dempton turned to him tugging at the corner of his mustache you must be aragon i would offer you a job too but roarin got the only one maybe in a year or two eh aragon smiled uneasily and shook his hand the man was friendly under other circumstances, Aragon would have liked him, but right then, he sourly wished that the miller had never come to Carvajal. Dempton huffed. Good. Very good. He returned his attention to Roran and started to explain how a mill worked. <laughs> That's all the training you get, too, so you better listen. <laughs> <laughs> I love how it's like they haven't even like left. Like They're just standing there, and he's like, all right, we're going to start. <laughs> Hope you brought a pen and paper. They're ready to go, interrupted Horst, gesturing at the table, where several bundles rested. You can take them whenever you want to, they shook hands, and Horst left the smithy, beckoning to Aragon on the way out. Interested, Aragon followed. He found the smith standing in the street with his arms crossed. Aragon thrust his thumb back toward the miller and asked, What do you think of him? Horst rumbled, A good man. He'll do fine with Roran. 
He absently brushed metal filings off his apron, then put a massive hand on Aragon's shoulder. Lad, do you remember the fight you had with Sloan? If you're asking about payment for the meat, I haven't forgotten. No, I trust you, lad. What I wanted to know is if you still have that blue stone. Aragon's heart fluttered. Why does he want to know? Maybe someone saw Sephira. Oh. Struggling not to panic, he said, I do, but why do you ask? As soon as you return home, get rid of it. Horse overrode Aragon's exclamation. Two men arrived here yesterday. Strange fellows dressed in black and carrying swords. It made my skin crawl just to look at them. Last evening, they started asking people if a stone like yours had been found. They're at it again today. Aragon blanched. No one with any sense said anything. They know trouble when they see it. But I can name a few people who will talk. Dread filled Aragon's heart. Whoever had sent the stone into the spine had finally tracked it down, or perhaps the Empire had learned of Sephira. He did not know which would be worse. Think, think. The egg is gone. It's impossible to find it now. But if they know what it was, it'll be obvious what happened. Saphir might be in danger. He took all his self-control to retain a casual air. Thanks for telling me. Do you know where they are? He was proud that his voice barely trembled. I didn't warn you because I thought you needed to meet those men. Leave Carvel Hall. Go home. All right, said Aragon to placate the smith. If you think I should, I do. Horse, horse face softened. I may be overreacting, but these strangers give me a bad feeling. It would be better, it would be better if you stay home until they leave. I'll try to keep them away from your farm, though. It may not do any good. Aragon looked at him gratefully. He wished he could tell him about Sephira. I'll leave now, he said, and hurried back to Roran. Aragon clasped his cousin's arm and bade him farewell. Aren't you going to stay a while? Roran asked with surprise. Aragon almost laughed. For some reason, the question struck him as funny. There's nothing for me to do, and I'm not going to stand around until you go. Well, said Roran doubtfully, I guess it's the last time we'll see each other for a few months. Eh, I'm sure it won't seem that long, said Aragon hastily. Take care and come back soon. He hugged Roran, then left. Horse was still in the street. Aware that the smith was watching, Aragon headed to the outskirts of Carvajal. Once the smithy was out of sight, he ducked behind a house and sneaked back through the village. Aragon kept to the shadows as he searched each street, listening for the slightest noise. His thoughts flashed to his room, where his, where his bow hung. He wished it was in his hand. He prowled across Carvajal, avoiding everyone until he heard a sibilant voice from around a house. Although his ears were keen, he had a strain to hear what was being said. When did this happen? The words were smooth like oiled glass and seemed to worm their way through the air. Underlying the speech was a strange hiss that also made his scalp prickle. About three months ago, someone else answered. Aragon identified him as Sloane. Shade's blood, he's telling them. He resolved to punch Sloane the next time they met. A third person spoke. The voice was deep and moist. It conjured, it conjured up images of creeping decay, mold, and other things best left untouched. Are you sure? We would hate to think that you had made a mistake. If that were so, it would be most unpleasant. Aragon could imagine only too well what they might do. Would anyone but the Empire dare threaten people like that? Probably not. But whoever sent the egg might be power enough, powerful enough to f use force with impunity. Yeah, I'm sure. He had it then. I'm not lying. Plenty of people know about it. Go ask them. Sloan sounded shaken. It's, he said something else that Aragon couldn't catch. They have been rather uncooperative. The words were derisive. There was a pause. Your information has been helpful. We will not forget you. Aragon believed him. Sloane muttered something, then Aragon heard someone hurrying away. He peered around the corner to see what was come happening. Two tall men stood in the street. Both were dressed in long black cloaks that were lifted by she sheaves poking past their legs. On their shirts were insignias intricately wrought with silver thread. Hoods shaded their faces, and their hands were covered by gloves. Their backs were oddly humped, as though their clothes were stuffed with padding. Aragon shifted slightly to get a better view. One of the strangers stiffened and grunted peculiarly to his companion. They both swiveled around and sank into crouches. Aragon's breath caught. Mortal fear clenched him. His eyes locked onto their hidden faces, and a stifling power fell over his mind, keeping him in place. He struggled against it and screamed to himself, Move! His legs swayed, but to no avail. The strangers stalked toward him with a smooth, noiseless gait. He knew they could see his face now. They were almost to the corner, hands grasping at swords. Aragon! 
He jerked at his, as his name was called. The stranger's frozen place and hissed. Brom hurried toward him from the side, head bare and staff in hand. The strangers were blocked from the old man's view. Aragon tried to warn him, but his tongue and arms would not stir. Aragon, cried Brom again. The strangers gave Aragon one last look, then slipped away between the houses. They were going to kill him dead. Aragon collapsed to the ground, shivering. Sweat beaded on his forehead and made his palm sticky. The old man offered Aragon a hand and pulled him up with a strong arm. You look sick. Is all well? Aragon gulped and nodded mutely. His eyes flicked around, searching for anything unusual. I just got dizzy all of a sudden. It's past. It was very odd. I don't know why it happened. You'll recover, said Brom. But perhaps it would be better if you went home. Yes, I have to get home. Home before they... Home to get there before they do. I think you're right. Maybe I'm getting ill. Then home is the best place for you. It's a long walk, but I'm sure you'll feel better by the time you arrive. Let me escort you to the road. Aragon did not protest as Brom took his arm and led him away at a quick pace. Brom's staff crunched in the snow as they passed the houses. Why were you looking for me? Brom sh shrugged. Simple curiosity. I learned you were in town and wondered if you remembered the name of that traitor. Traitor? What's he talking about? Aragon stared blankly. His confusion caught the attention of Brom's probing eyes. No, he said, and then amended himself. I'm afraid I still don't remember. Brom sighed gruffly, as if something had been confirmed, and rubbed his eagle nose. Well then, if you do, come tell me. I'm most interested in this traitor who pretends to know so much about dragons. Aragon nodded with a distracted air. They walked in silence to the road, then Brom said, Hasten home. I don't think it would be a good idea to tarry on the way. He offered a gnarled hand. Aragon shook it, but as he let go, something in Brom's hand caught on his mitt and pulled it off. It fell to the ground. The old man picked it up. Cl clumsy of me, he apologized and handed it back. As Aragon took the mitt, Brom's strong fingers wrapped around his wrist and twist sharply. His, pa his palm briefly faced upward, revealing the silvery mark. Brom's eyes glinted. But he let Aragon yank his hand back and jam it into the mitt. Goodbye, Aragon forced out, perturbed, and hurried down the road. Behind him, he heard Brom whistling a merry tune. Fucking knew it. Knew what? Like, Brom fucking knew it. Like, because Brom was like, it's interesting that this traitor knows a weird amount about dragons. And that you just don't remember the name of this person who just knows a lot about a cool thing. And then he asked him, like, again, like, do you know the traitor's name? And then Aragon, like obviously like Probably blank is, like yeah just looks confused like what are you even talking about and then was like no and then he, that's when he was like like his heavy breathing was mm -hmm. a sign of confirmation like knew it little bitch chapter 10 flight of destiny Ooh, i wonder what this could be about aragon's mind churned as he sped on his way he ran as fast as he could refusing to stop even when his breath came in great gasps as he panted down the cold road, he cast out his mind for Safira, but she was too far away for him to contact. He thought about what to say to Garrow. There was no choice now. He would have to re reveal Safira. He arrived home, panting for air and heart pounding. Garrow stood by the barn with the horses. Aragon hesitated. Should I talk to him now? He won't believe me unless Safira is here. I'd better find her first. He slipped around the farm and into the forest. Safira! He shouted mm -hmm. with his thoughts. I wouldn't have done it that way. Why? Because you can't just show up with a fucking dragon. At least, True. like, let you Fucking give him a it. heart attack. Like, I'd be like, yo, that stone, actually a dragon egg. And then have him be like, stop toying around. He's like, I'm serious. There's like, two men in the village right now looking for us. I just want to let you know. Do you want to see Safira? And then. Like, I'll sh I can show you. And he's like, holy fuck, dude. This is getting real. Real fast. <laughs> Instead of, like, coming around with a dragon, be like, a, dra a dragon! <laughs> yeah, I just feel like that's. I mean, he's 15. Whatever. Uh, he slipped around the farm and into the forest. Safira, he shouted with his thoughts. I come, was a dim reply. Through the words he sensed her alarm, he waited impatiently, though it was not long before, he's, before the sound of her wings filled the air. She landed amid a gout of smoke. What happened? She queried. He touched her shoulder and closed his eyes. Calming his mind, he quickly told her what had occurred. When he mentioned the stranger, Safira recoiled. She reared and roared deafeningly, then whipped her tail over his head. He scrambled back in surprise, ducking as her tail hit a snowdrift. Bloodlust and fear emanated from her in great, sickening waves. Fire! Enemies! Death! Murderers! 
What's wrong? He put all of his strength into the words, but an iron wall surrounded her mind, shielding her thoughts. She let out another roar and gouged the earth with her claws, tearing the frozen ground. Stop it! Garrow will hear! Oaths betrayed, souls killed, eggs shattered, blood everywhere, murderers! Frantic, he blocked out Sephira's emotions and watched her tail. When it flicked past him, he dashed to her side and grabbed a spike on, on her back. Clutching it, he pulled himself into the small hollow at the base of her neck and held on tightly as she reared again. Enough, Sephira, he bellowed. Her stream of thoughts ceased abruptly. He ran a hand over her skills. Everything's going to be all right. She crouched and her rings rushed upward and her wings rushed upward. They hung there for an instant, then drove down as she flung herself into the sky. Aragon yelled as the ground dropped away, and they rose above the trees. Turbulence buffeted him, snatching the breath out of his mouth. Zephyr ignored his terror and banked around the spine or toward the spine. Underneath he glimpsed the farm and the Anora River. His stomach convulsed. He tightened his arms around Sephira's neck and, co neck and concentrated on the scales in front of his nose, trying not to vomit as she continued to climb. When she leveled off, he gained the courage to glance around. The air was so cold that frost accumulated on his eyelashes. They had reached the mountains faster than he thought possible. From the air, the peaks looked like giant razor-sharp teeth waiting to slash them to ribbons. Sephira wobbled unexpectedly and Aragon heaved over her side. He wiped his lips, tasting bile, and buried his head against her neck. We have to go back, he pleaded. The strangers are coming for to the farm. Garrow has to be warned. Turn around. There was no answer. He reached for her mind, but was blocked by a bar barrier of roiling fear and anger. Determined to make her turn around, he grimly wormed into her mental armor. He pushed at its weak places, undermined the stronger sections, and fought to make her listen, but to no avail. Soon mountains surrounded them, forming tremendous white walls broken by granite cliffs. Blue glaciers sat between the summits like frozen rivers. Long valleys and ravines opened beneath them. He heard the dismayed screech of birds far below as Sephira soared into view. He saw a herd of woolly goats bounding from ledge to ledge on a rocky bluff. Aragon was battered by swirling gusts from Sephira's wings, and whenever she moved her neck, he was tossed from side to side. She seemed tireless. He was afraid she was going to fly through the night. Finally, as darkness fell, she tilted into a shallow dive. He looked ahead and saw that they were headed for a small clearing in a valley. Sephira spiraled down, leisurely drifting over the treetops, she pulled back as she ground neared, or as, what the fuck? She pulled back as the ground neared, filled her wings with air, and landed on her rear legs. Her powerful muscles rippled as they absorbed the shock of impact. She dropped to all fours and skipped to a step to keep her balance. <clears throat> or skipped a step to keep her balance. Aragon slid off without waiting for her to fold her wings. As he struck the ground, his knees buckled and his cheeks slammed against the snow. He gasped as excruciating pain seared through his legs, sending tears to his eyes. His muscles, cramped from clenching for so long, shook violently. He rolled onto his back, shivering, and stretched his limbs as best he could. Then he forced himself to look down. Two large blots darkened his wool pants on the insides of his thighs. He touched the fabric. It was wet. Alarmed, he peeled off the pants and grimaced. The insides of his legs were raw and bloody. The skin was gone, rubbed off by Sephira's hard scales. He gingerly felt the abrasions and winced. Cold bit into him as he pulled the pants back on, and he cried out as they scraped against his sensitive wounds. He tried to stand, but his legs would not support him. The deepening night obscured his surroundings. The shaded mountains were unfamiliar. I'm in the spine. I don't know where. During the middle of winter, with a crazed dragon, unable to walk or find shelter, night is falling. I have to get back to the farm tomorrow, and the only way to do that is to fly, which I can't endure anymore. He took a deep breath. Oh, I wish the fear could breathe fire. <laughs> he turned his head and saw her next to him, crouched low to the ground. He put a hand on her side and found it trembling. The berry in her mind was gone. Without it, her fear scorched through him. He clamped down on it and slowly soothed her with gentle images. Why do the strangers frighten you? Murderer, she hissed. Garrow is in danger, and you kidnap me on this ridiculous journey. Are you unable to protect me? She growled deeply and snapped her jaws. Ah, but if you think you can, why run? Death is a poison. He leaned on one elbow and stifled his frustration. Sephira, look where we are. The sun is down, and your flight has stripped my legs as easily as I would scale a fish. Is that what you wanted? No. 
Then why did you do it? He demanded. Through his link with Safira, he felt her regret for his pain, but not for her actions. She looked away and refused to answer. The icy temperature deadened Aragon's legs, although it lessened the pain. He knew that his condition was not good. He changed tack. I'm going to freeze unless you make me a shelter or hollow so I can stay warm. Even a pile of pine needles and branches would do. She seemed relieved that he stopped interrogating her. There is no need. I will curl around you and cover you with my wings. The fire inside me will stay the cold. Aragon let his head thump back on the ground. Fine, but scrape the snow off the ground. It'll be more comfortable. In answer, Saphira raised a drift with her tail, clearing it in one powerful stroke. She swept over the side again to remove the last few inches of hardened snow. He eyed the exposed dirt with distaste. I can't walk over there. You'll have to help me to it. <laughs> her head, larger than his torso, swung over him and came to rest by his side. He stared at her large, sapphire-colored eyes and wrapped his hands around one of her ivory spikes. She lifted her head and slowly dragged him to the bare spot. Gently, gently, stars danced in his eyes as he slid over a rock. But he managed to hold on. After he let go, Sophia rolled on her side, exposing her warm belly. He huddled against the smooth scales of her underside. Her right wing extended over him and enclosed him in complete darkness, forming a living tent. Almost immediately, the air began to lose its frigidity. Frig, frigidity. Wow, why choose that word? <laughs> he pulled his arms inside his coat and tied the empty sleeves around his neck. For the first time, he noticed that hunger gnawed at his stomach, but it did not distract him from his main worry. Could he get back to the farm before the strangers did? And if not, what would happen? Even if I can force myself to ride Saphira again, it'll be at least mid-afternoon before we get back. The strangers could be there long before that. He closed his eyes and felt a single tear slide down his face. What have I done? Should have told Geralt first. Fucking knew it. Chapter 11. The Doom of Innocence. When Aragon opened his eyes in the morning, he thought the sky had fallen. An unbroken plane of blue stretched over his head and slanted on the ground. Still half asleep, he reached out tentatively and felt a thin membrane under his fingers. It took him a long minute to realize what he was staring at. He bent his neck slightly and glared at the scaly haunch his head rested on. Slowly, he pushed his legs out from his fetal curl, scabs cracking. The pain had subsided. It just... Like, this... It's such a sensitive part, like, your, like, upper inside thighs, that, like, just imagining this is just making my muscles and just, cramp. Yeah, and then, like, just imagine, like, movement happening, like, underneath you as something is, like, just moving around, and then you're just, like, gripping with your legs, because that's all you can grip with fucking rub all your skin away oof at least he's in a nice like little skin tent little dragon tent <laughs> little dragon wing tent <clears throat> the pain had subsided some from yesterday but he shrank from the thought of walking burning hunger reminded him of his missed meals he summoned the energy to move and pounded weakly on Sophia's side hey wake up he yelled she stirred and lifted her wing to admit a torrent of sunshine he squinted as the snow momentarily blinded him Beside him, Saphira stretched like a cat and yawned, flashing rows of white teeth. When Aragon's eyes adjusted, he examined where they were. Imposing and unfamiliar mountains surrounded them, casting deep shadows on the clearing. Off to one side, he saw a trail cut through the snow and into the forest where he could hear the muffled gurgling of a creek. That makes sense? Yeah, why would it not make sense? I just felt like the way I read it S oh. sounded weird. Groaning, he stood and swayed, then stiffly hobbled to a tree. He grabbed one of its branches and threw his weight against it. It held, then broke with a loud crack. It held, then broke. <laughs> <laughs> he ripped off the twigs, fit one end of the branch under his arm, and planted the other firmly in the ground. With the help of his improvised crutch, he limped to the iced-over creek. He broke through the hard shell and cupped the clear, bitter water. Sated, he returned to the clearing. As he emerged from the trees, he finally recognized the mountains and the lay of the land. This was where, amid deafening sound, Saphira's egg had first appeared. That's weird. He but sagged against a rough trunk. There could be no mistake, for now he saw the gray trees that had been stripped of their needles in the explosion. How did Saphira know where this was? She was still in the egg. My memories must have given her enough information to find it. He shook his head in silent astonishment. Saphira was waiting patiently for him. Will you take me home? He asked her. She cocked her head. I know if you don't want to, or I know you don't want to, but you must. Both of us carry an obligation to Garo. He has cared for me and through me you. Would you ignore that debt? What will be said of us in years to come if we don't return? 
that we hid like cowards while my uncle was in danger. I can hear it now, the story of the rider and his craven dragon. If there will be a fight, let's face it, and not shy away. You are a dragon. Even a shade would run from you. Yet you crouch in the mountains like a frightened rabbit. Aragon meant to anger her, and he succeeded. A growl rippled in her throat as her head jabbed within a few inches of his face. She bared her fangs and glared at him, smoke trailing from her nostrils. He hoped he had not gone too far. Her thoughts reached him, red with anger. Blood will meet blood. I will fight. Our words, our fates bind us, but try me not. I will take you because of debt owed, but into foolishness. Foolishness we fly. Our words. Spelled like weird. I don't know. Our wires? Is that like a different word completely? I don't know. Let's look it up because that's weird. So in the ancient language, Wyarda, I think is what it is. Worda is fate. How would you pronounce that? Worda? Yeah, Worda or Weirda. So I think she's saying our words are fate. Okay. How she has knowledge of the ancient language is interesting. Maybe it's just like in their DNA. Maybe. Foolishness or not, he said into the air. There is no choice. We must go. He ripped his shirt in half and stuffed a piece into each side of his pants. Gingerly, he hoisted himself onto Sephira and took a tight hold on her neck. This time, he told her, fly lower and faster. Time is of the essence. Don't let go, she cautioned, then surged into the air. They rose above the forest and leveled out immediately, barely staying above the branches. Aragon's stomach lurched. He was glad it was empty. Faster, faster, he urged. She said nothing, but the beat of her wings increased. He screwed his eyes shut and hunched his shoulders. He had hoped that the extra padding of his shirt would protect him, but every movement sent pangs through his legs. Soon, lines of hot blood trickled down his calves. Concern emanated from Sephira. She went even faster now, her wings straining. The land, spe- or the land sped past as if it were being pulled out from under them. Aragon imagined that to someone on the ground, they were just a blur. By early afternoon, Palancar Valley lay before them. Clouds obscured his vision to the south. Carvajal was to the north. Sephira glided down while Aragon searched for the farm, but when he spotted it, fear jolted him. A black plume with orange flames dancing at its base rose from the farm. His uncle's dead. Way to go. Sephira, he pointed. Get me down there, now! She locked her wings and tilted into a steep dive, hurtling groundward at a frightening rate. Then she altered her dive slightly, so they sped toward the forest. He yelled over the screaming air, Land in the fields! He held on tighter as they plummeted. Sephira waited until they were only a hundred feet off the ground before driving her wings downward in several powerful strokes. She landed heavily, breaking his grip. He crashed to the ground, then staggered upright, gasping for breath. The house had been blasted apart. Timbers and boards that had been walls and roof were strewn across a wide area. The wood was pulverized as if a giant hammer had smashed it. Sooty shingles lay everywhere. A few twisted metal plates were all that remained of the stove. The snow was perforated with smashed white crockery and chunks of bricks from the chimney. Thick, oily smoke billowed from the barn, which burned fiercely. The farm animals were gone, either killed or frightened away. Uncle! Aragon ran to the wreckage, hunting through the destroyed rooms for Garrow. There was no sign of him. Uncle! Aragon cried again. Sephira walked around the house and came to her side. Sorrow breeds here, she said. This wouldn't have happened if you hadn't run away with me. Would you? Mm, Probably she would have ran away and then it still would have happened. (laughs) And then she says, you would not be alive if we had stayed. Look at this, he screamed. We could have warned Garrow. It's your fault he didn't get away. He slammed his fist against the pole, splitting the skin on his knuckles. Blood dripped down his fingers as he stalked out of the house. He stumbled to the path that led to the road and bent down to examine the snow. Several tracks were before him, but his vision was blurry and he could barely see. Am I going blind, he wondered. With a shaking hand, he touched his cheeks and found them wet. A shadow fell on him as Sephira loomed overhead, sheltering him with her wings. Take comfort. All may not be lost. He looked up at her, searching for hope. Examine the trail. Or, uh... Examine the trail. My eyes see only two sets of prints. Garrow could not have been taken from here. He focused on the trampled snow. The faint imprints of two pairs of leather boots headed toward the house. On top of those were traces of the same two sets of boots leaving, and whoever had made the departing tracks had been carrying the same weight as when they arrived. You're right. Garrow has to be here. He leapt to his feet and hurried back to the house. I will search around the buildings and in the forest, said Sephira. 
Aragon scrambled into the remains of the kitchen and frantically started digging through a pile of rubble. Pieces of debris that he could not have moved normally now seemed to shift on their own accord. A cupboard, mostly intact, stimmied him for a second. Then he heaved it and sent it flying. As he pulled on a board, something rattled behind him. He spun around, ready for an attack. A hand extended from under a section of collapsed roof. It moved weakly, and he grasped it with a cry. Uncle, can you hear me? There was no response. Aragon tore at pieces of wood, heedless of the splinters that pierced his hands. He quickly exposed an arm and shoulder, but was barred by a heavy beam. He threw his shoulder at it and shoved with every fiber of his being, but, if, but it defied his efforts. Sephira, I need you. She came immediately. Wood cracked under her feet as she crawled over the ruined walls. Without a word, she nosed past him and set her side against the beam. Her claws sank into what left of the... Or her claws sank into what was left of the floor. Her muscles strained. With a grating sound, the beam lifted and Aragon rushed under it. Garrow lay on his stomach, his clothes mostly torn off. Aragon pulled him out of the rubble. As soon as they were clear, Sephira released the beam, leaving it to crash to the floor. Aragon dragged Garrow out of the destroyed house and eased him to the ground. Dismayed, he touched his uncle, uncle gently. His skin was gray, lifeless, and dry, as if a fever had burned off any sweat. His lip was split, and there was a long scrape on his cheekbone, but that was not the worst. Deep, ragged burns covered most of his body. They were chalky white and oozed clear liquid. A cloying, sickening smell hung over him, the odor of rotting fruit. His breath came in short jerks, each one sounding like a death rattle. Murderers, hissed Sephira. Don't say that. He can still be saved. We have to get him to Gertrude. I can't carry him to Carvajal, though. Sephira presented an image of Garrow hanging under her while she flew. Can you lift both of us? I must. Aragon dug through the rubble until he found a board and leather thongs. He had Sephira pierce a hole with a claw at each of the board's corners, and he looped a piece of leather through each hole and tied them to her forelegs. After checking to make sure that or after checking to make sure the knots were secure, he rolled Garrow onto the board and lashed him down. As he did, a scrap of black cloth fell from his uncle's hand. It matched the stranger's clothing. He angrily stuffed it in a pocket. Mounted Saphir and closed his eyes, and his body settled into a steady throb of pain. Now! She leapt up, hind legs digging into the ground. Her wings clawed at the air as she slowly climbed, tendons strained and popped as she battled gravity. For a long, painful second, nothing happened. But then they lunged forward powerfully, and they rose higher. Once they were over the forest, Aragon told her, Follow the road. It'll give you enough room if you have to land. I might be seen. It doesn't matter anymore. She argued no further, as she veered to the road and headed for Carvajal, Garrow swung wildly underneath them. Only the slender leather cords kept him from falling. The extra weight slowed Sephira. Before long, her head sagged, and there was froth at her mouth. She struggled to continue, yet, there, yet they were almost a league from Carvajal when she locked her wings and sank toward the ground. Her hind feet touched with a shower of snow. Aragon tumbled off her, landing heavily to his side to avoid hurting his legs. He struggled to his feet and worked to untie the leather from Sephira's legs. Her thick panting filled the air. Find a safe place to rest, he said. I don't know how long I'll be gone, so you're going to have to take care of yourself for a while. I will wait, she said. He gritted his teeth and began to drag Garrow down the road. The, fir the first few steps sent an explosion of agony through him. I can't do this, he howled at the sky, and then took a few more steps. His mouth locked into a snarl. He stared at the ground between his feet as he forced himself to hold a steady pace. It was a fight against his unruly body, a fight he refused to lose. The minutes crawled by at an excruciating rate. Each yard he covered seemed many times that. With desperation, he wondered if Carvel Hole still existed, or if the strangers had burned it down too. After a time, through a haze of pain, he heard shouting and looked up. Brom was running toward him, eyes large, hair awry, and one of his and one side of his head caked with dried blood. He waved his arms wildly before dropping his staff and grabbing Aragon's shoulders, saying something in a loud voice. Aragon blinked uncomprehendingly. Without warning, the ground rushed up to meet him. He tasted blood, then blacked out. Jesus. <laughs> what? I don't know. That just was like, holy shit. What a fucking six pages or whatever. Like, fuck. And then it, he should have just fucking told Gerald first. What was he thinking? Stupid 15-year-old boy. I'm so sick of teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, realistically, what would have happened if he would have told Gerald first? They could have left. They would have outran the strangers, though. The strangers probably would have caught up. And then they would have been... F then it would have been even worse. Aragon probably would have died. 
Warning. 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 Spoiler alert. You have been warned. And Garo still would have died. Garo's dead, you think? <laughs> you fucking ass full. Full. Ass full. Ass fold. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Is it not obvious? I mean... It seems like the most likely thing to happen, but I don't know at this point. He could be alive. I don't fucking know. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <sighs> this is like Rita all over again. It's like what? Rita all over again. Oh, shit. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh! forget what I said. I can't. Oh, no. You fucked me. Great. Everyone's dead. I feel bad now. <sighs> and I couldn't even try to like cover up what I said. I'm too tired to. Oh, that's so sad. And then Roran is gone. Is gone. And he's going to come. Like, his dad's dead. Like, Roran's like, oh, I'll leave and everything will be great and fine. And it's like he probably didn't have as good of like a goodbye or a send off. As he would have Because he was expecting to come back in a yeah. couple months. And so then he's like, literally the day after he leaves. His dad's dead. We actually don't even know at this point, like, when he is, like, like, when all of this took place. Like, that could have taken place the same day they saw Aragon. It could have taken place the next morning. It could have been the same fucking day Roran left his dad died. Yeah. I'll leave the farm. And then at least Roran's safe, though. We don't or know. I don't know because maybe Brom's killed... head is caked in blood. Ooh, maybe they killed Roran too. Maybe they took him, captured him. Mm. I feel like if I were in their position, I wouldn't even like give a shit. Because they know what the stone is or was. Or else why would they be like stalking around town looking for it? Yeah. So like they know what it was and so they probably have a good idea that it's hatched. And so they have a good idea that there's probably a dragon somewhere. So they're not going to look for Roran. They're going to go look for a dragon. Yeah. Like, Aragorn's gone. That's good problem-solving logic. That's good logic. Because, like, Aragorn brought it up earlier. He said, like, if anybody knew what they were looking for, the signs of a dragon are, like, all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like, poop piles and yeah. scratching on trees and brushing up against trees and shit so yeah. like so they, i feel like for them it would be a waste of time to go to roran because they know that aragon probably escaped with the dragon and they probably destroyed the farm looking for the stone right or the egg and then, didn't find the egg and, and then, went mm, it hatched mm, mm, there's a dragon there's a dragon rider around here so i feel like at this point they wouldn't even waste their time with roran Unless they wanted to know where Aragon could have gone. Or just double check and make sure that Roran wasn't the dragon rider. Right. So, who knows? All we know is Brahm's alive. Or they didn't see the egg stone, and so they still think it's maybe hidden. Mm -hmm. Unless yeah. they looked around and they saw evidence of a dragon, and they would go, shit. I just hope Roran's alive, because... I don't think I can handle another teenage boy character with our whole family dead. Like, I just don't know if I can do another fantasy story like that <laughs> in a row. Is it, His whole family's going to fucking die, isn't it? I swear to God. You think Roran's going to die? I don't know. <clears throat> you think Garrow's dead? For real? I know he is. Because I know how you do this thing. You just accidentally slip up and then you go, I could be joking. Could be a trick. I just. Or you say, I never said that. <laughs> even just like reading it my first time, I just always thought it was so obvious. I mean. <sighs> I mean, maybe, maybe it wasn't so obvious. Maybe it was like every, maybe people reading it were like, oh, Garrow going to pull through, but. Cause like, <sighs> I don't know. I don't, I hate the word obvious so much. Because, like, it's a story. It's What's, a like, fucking... obvious to you isn't obvious to me. Yeah. Like, I get it. Because, like, yeah, like, logically, the likeliness of him dying is very high. 
but like I don't know if he it's gonna be like some weird ex machina mm-hmm. thing where like and it's like he pulls through for the plot. It's like a different type of obvious too. Whereas like it's obvious that this book is about dragons <laughs> and the story is about a guy named Aragon that he would that a dragon egg would hatch for him. Like mm-hmm. like that's a different type of obvious and like is Garo gonna die or not? Like, yeah, he's really close to death. But, like, how do I know he doesn't play a part in the plot later? True. Spoiler alert, I guess. Whoops. You're going to have to spoiler well. alert this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Put those little, like, wee 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 lights. Wee. Warning. Spoiler alert. Use that <laughs> audio clip for later. <laughs> I'm so excited for the next chapters. Because that was a cliffhanger if I've ever seen one. <laughs> Hell yeah. That was a cliffhanger because it's like, like and tasted blood and saw blackness are so passed like, out. So Safira is obviously fucked up too, like exhausted. Yeah. Mainly just exhausted, like not fucked up. She's just very, very tired. But like we don't really know. He said she was frothing at the mouth. She could have rabies for all we know. <laughs> no. So. <laughs> it's like when the dogs are out in the sun and they like are playing too much and they start foaming at the mouth and we're like, okay, it's time to go inside. And they're or like. like Frey gets excited about eating and she starts foaming at the mouth. <laughs> so. <laughs> like, I get it. I'm just saying, like, at this point, it's like everyone's just in a really bad, like, their health is all just fucked up. Everybody's just fucked up. Except Broyer. And he's just like, I'm going to go work at a mill and get a wife and work on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm having, like, flashbacks of Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> Brother? No. No. <laughs> Well, because it's like the brothers go away and they just are and like, Hughes. we're, we're going to come back to Central and see Hughes. And then they never did. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, shit. Wow. Everybody's dead. That was a good three chapters. That was jam-packed with some shit. I like, uh, I like it when chapters are like not jam-packed. Because, like, that wasn't a lot of pages yeah, really, I, compared to chapter three. It, but it, it kept everything, like, moving in a very, like, nice pace to where, like, it, it left you wanting to read more. Yeah. I feel like I can feel him getting in, like, a writing groove. Yeah. And, like, <clears throat> you could, like, feel the groove because I feel like as a reader you got in a groove. And so that's exciting. And then, um, oh, fuck, what was I going to say? I just started thinking about grooves. <laughs> <laughs> Your mind is an enigma. <laughs> oh, man. Well. <laughs> I don't know what I was going to say. Cool. Comments. <laughs> oh, my God. Why am I like this? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have you any other way. <laughs> oh, what I was going to say. <laughs> Is that it wasn't like an overload of information. It was like just enough information for me to. <laughs> it was just enough. Just <laughs> Woo! It was just enough information for me to <laughs> create like what was going on in my head. But it wasn't so like latches and brooms and fucking ingots and shit. Yeah, I get it. It was. Like, description through action. Yeah, it was good. My first comment is from Dominique Taylor. She said, wow, you uploaded this right when I was about to start listening to the audiobook. I will listen to your version instead. (laughs) Hell yeah. I feel like we're going to take over audio, like, not audiobooks in the sense that we're replacing audiobooks, but, like, what we're... Because we're not. This is not an audiobook. That, like, like, the discussion portion of it is just so much more... Engaging. Yeah. We are transforming the work in nature (laughs) by adding commentary um she said also really good work on the two harry potter books you guys helped me through some boring days at work you're welcome thank you for listening and you're welcome (laughs) um then my next comment is from blue slushy blue slushy said when are we gonna get a meat update a meat update (laughs) mead Honey wine. Well, let me tell you. <clears throat> so now that we told everyone that like what's happening, um, 
I was going to do like I was going to make more mead, but then I found out that we're moving, so I didn't make any mead. Because why would I make mead when we're moving? I don't even know if we can take back the stores of the mead that we have right now. So we might have to drink that before we go. <laughs> I'll start tonight. Oof. <laughs> oh, I had a mead. Me and Demi actually recorded a mead video. Like we were taste testing and everything. But like we had like a camera down here that was like on the glasses. And we were like tasting the old mead. And we drank that mead. And then we were test like drinking the new mead. And like every we made like this awesome video. And then, for some reason, the camera that was up here just didn't record anything. <laughs> so all we have is audio and visual from our like hands. Fr- of our hands and our lower bodies of us talking. So it was a complete waste of time. And then I just deleted all of the video that I had. And so I still have to update, like create an update video on like the mead. It turned out great. <laughs> we drank a few bottles of it. We tried to make a video of it, but nothing worked out. But once we, like, get settled in after we move, we'll definitely be making more meat. And it'll be nice because we'll be able to get supplies quicker. Yeah, I'll try to make a meat update video, obviously, before we leave. Mm-hmm. And then just showing you guys, like, the meat, how it turned out. Because <clears throat> I think I even tried to make a bottling video and it didn't work. Hmm. Maybe I did make a bot. I don't remember. I don't, think it- I don't think I had the footage or the audio got fucked up or something. But we will be making mead more mead we have more mead recipes that we want to try once we get to north dakota and i have a new like way to start doing everything like i have a whole new process that i'm gonna try so that'll be exciting i am so excited same penguin rampage (laughs) (laughs) what a name (laughs) said i was so glad i started listening to the harry potter series you guys did there was there was one of the after video discussions you did, and you guys were talking about the next series. Series. Dad said, it's easy. There's really only two voices I have to do. I got so excited thinking it would be Aragon. I was right. The fellow Ravenclaw spirit. Can't wait to see the reactions from Demi as the next few chapters play out. Thanks, you two, for keeping my work days entertaining. That's You're welcome. A nice little comment. I've noticed that we've, get, we've been getting a lot of people saying, thank you for keeping my work days entertaining. I'm like, where are you guys working? Where are you That's guys? That's so awful. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like either it's an exaggeration or people just have really awful jobs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or they just have jobs where they can just listen to YouTube all day. I had a job like that. I mean, kind of. I have a job like that <laughs> when it's night shift. <laughs> but you were right about Aragon, but I was actually talking about Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Oh. Shit. Because that's what I had in mind because I put Aragon up in the vote with all the mm-hmm. other books. And so I was thinking of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas when I said that because there's only like two voices you have to do. And now that I'm thinking about it in Aragon, there's only like really ever two to three voices that you have to do like wow. max at a time. So I guess Christopher just couldn't handle more than three characters at a time. He is up to like 10 characters at a time. So <laughs> no. I'm just, I really like to hate on teenage boys, I think. I think that's, like, my thing. Did a teenage boy hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you, Penguin Rampage. <laughs> what a name. I'm just thinking of a penguin rampage now. I just... <clears throat> like a penguin stampede. A stampeding penguin rampage. And it's even a picture of a penguin. What? Rampage, rampaging. It's so fun. How do people? How do you guys come up with names like this? It's ridiculous. I love it. My first comment is from JDPC. He said, "Well, guys, you did it during the live stream. I'm really thinking about doing a blog of some kind of paranormal conspiracy stuff and symbolism." Get back here. <laughs> I'm looking into. Uh, I'm looking into place to create easy websites because I'm a mess at do- doing programming. I'll tell you whenever I find. I'll tell you whenever I find something and started the place. As for now, I deleted the old bunch of game video about my YouTube channel and uploaded a couple music video of my own guitar composition. Way to make my channel a bit more personal. Over time, I'll probably use it to host video related to the blog too. That's so exciting. That was very cool. So everyone check out JDPC's channel. Um, He's doing his own guitar compositions. And then... Oh shit, that's cool. Yeah, and then... He's going to be coming out with a website of some sorts with 
conspiracy theories. So that'll be fucking cool. Now you I'm have excited to, for that. We announced it. <laughs> and now you have to because it's 3,000 subscribers official. They're all waiting. They're all waiting now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank That's you, like, JDPC. And I'm excited to see what ooh. you create because just your comments are phenomenal. I can't imagine like actual website. It's going to be a whole nother level. Lit fam. Lit fam. <laughs> Galaxy Girl 9000 said, These chapters were really interesting, though I can't quite understand how these chapters were so short right after that obnoxiously long one. <laughs> but I like these because a lot of stuff happened. It wasn't just Aragon trying to figure out stuff about the stone. But anyways, Demi was talking possible fathers for Aragon, and my mind went to Galbatorix, Galbatorix for the father. And Demi asked that question right after, but I'm going to actually fight someone if dragon riderness is inherited through genetics or some sort of stuff because I have read and seen too many things there were there is some plot twist where a character has some evil father and stuff i mean i'm still recovering from the whole delphi voldemort thing i can't have another one of these thrown at me so soon anyways love you guys loved the dead cast today too thank you galaxy girl 9000 it was awesome seeing you in the the chat during the live stream but also i think you will be pleasantly surprised in the long run oh my god is it brahm I think you will be pleasantly <laughs> surprised in the long run. Cool. So hopefully not a bad guy. Cause that's, yeah. Like I, what a, what do they call it? Like a trope? The or was light. I saying that in a sarcastic manner that meant nothing you, could you be will any- not be happy. Was I saying it in the sense of you will be happy or was I being sarcastic and saying you will not be happy? I don't know. I can't tell with you. I learned my face masking abilities from Snape. How irritating. How irritating. Um, Obviously. Yeah, I still like can't get over the whole Delphi Voldemort thing. I saw like I get like videos recommended about like Delphi and Voldemort. And I'm like, who cares? It's stupid. Yep. <laughs> cool glad we have a channel about discussion and then i'm trying to discuss and would you say delphi and voldemort was annoying that he had a daughter and that she was the evil one i mean like that's not really what i was saying but close enough (laughs) like how we have a channel about discussion and i'm like (laughs) trying to discuss things and you go close enough i'm gonna kill you in your sleep (laughs) (laughs) alan forrest i said to dead so can you please leave while I read? Okay. Just kidding. When I wrote that comment on chapter three video, I didn't even realize that bleep could have meant a later met person. It was just a nice, mysterious coincidence. Hm. Little inside joke between me and Alan for everyone else that doesn't know what we're talking about. But if you know what we're talking about, then you're on the inside joke too. But Demi's on the outside. <laughs> Whatever. So fucking <laughs> sad. It made me mad. <laughs> and that's all I got because you stole all of my comments no we didn't all of them <laughs> yeah remember how i said i had six ready <laughs> you three? read three of them great minds or something great minds or something great minds discuss alike <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> Well, everyone, a little bit of Demi's crazy slipped out. (laughs) So I'm going to end the episode here. We got to (laughs) go. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching, as always. Thank you for everyone who came out to the live stream event. I know the last video said, like, thank you for coming to the live stream event, but that was pre-post talk. Now we can post post talk or just regular post talk. Holy shit, because I guess a live stream would have been, like, days ago. Yeah. (laughs) Congratulations to the three winners. The married couple and JDPC. The shepherds. The shepherds. Ashley and Larry. Ashley and Larry. She- Congratulations, Ashley and Larry Shepherd and JDPC. We are still fucking around. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to draw something that looks good, and I don't know. But we suck at drawing. <laughs> I do not. I think I'm a relatively good drawer. <laughs> And on that note, we will see you in the next one. <laughs> drawer. Drawer. Are you a drawer? <laughs> yeah. You open up. Try to open you up. <laughs> <laughs> it's an art.
artist. You're a good artist. You draw well. I'm a good drawer. <laughs> Someone who draws is a drawer. Illustrator.